Hello, marine biology students. This week, we're going to talk about life living within the water column itself, both nearshore and offshore. So this week, we'll be talking about diversity of life in the epipelagic, challenges of living in the epipelagic, then we'll be talking about the communities in the mesopelagic or middle waters, and then the bottom communities as well in the deep waters and also on the sea floor. When we look at the different ways to categorize regions of the ocean, the pelagic is going to be all of the open water column away from the bottom. So we call this the pelagic realm. Now the pelagic is made up of nearshore and offshore waters. The epipelagic is going to be the surface layer of these waters, and we'll see the epipelagic both nearshore or neuritic and offshore, or oceanic. The prefix epi means on top of, or surface of, and so the epipelagic are the surface waters, to a depth of about 200 meters. They are divided into the neuritic waters, which are the waters over the continental shelf. These are the shallow waters, which we'd call the subtidal zone. The oceanic waters are those waters that are past the shelf break. They are the waters beyond the continental shelf. So some of the characteristics of the epipelagic, whether we're talking about nearshore or offshore, these are going to be the warmest portion of the water column. This is also the most well-lit portion of the water column. We sometimes refer to it as the photic zone, but light can be limiting both in high latitudes and also at night. The epipelagic are vast stretches of water that support primary production. This primary production supports organisms in the epipelagic, as well as organisms in other communities. This primary production can go to other communities by ways of water currents, and also, especially, sinking. In the epipelagic, there is no substrate for attachment. There's no bottom for burrowing or deposit feeding. The places to hide from predators are extremely limited. But in that same way, predators cannot easily catch their prey for the same reason. In the epipelagic, there are the active swimmers and the drifters. We'll talk about the drifters first, the plankton. Plankton thrives in the epipelagic. The plankton includes all organisms that cannot swim against the prevailing currents. Many are microscopic. In fact, plankton is classified by size, by trophic level, or by the length of time spent in the plankton. This diagram shows the designation of plankton based on size. The smallest plankton are the femtoplankton. These are going to be the viruses of the ocean. Picoplankton are going to be made up of archaea and bacteria, including cyanobacteria. Nanoplankton will be very small protists, and some of these will be photosynthetic, while others will be consumers. The next groups of plankton, the microplankton, mesoplankton, and macroplankton, are considered to be net plankton because they are the types of plankton that can be caught in plankton nets. Since this was the main means of observing plankton for a long period of marine biology history, this group were thought to be the most important and most abundant for a long time. It wasn't until molecular biology studies were done to show just how much viruses and bacteria and archaea and ciliate and nanoplankton there are to realize that the net plankton is actually just a portion of the picture. 
And then there are the large drifting organisms, such as jellyfish, pelagic kelp, and siphonophores. These aren't necessarily considered net plankton because they can be too large, but they do drift with the currents. Oceanographers have spent a lot of time and energy studying net plankton. Because those were the types that could be observed with the established techniques. However, with molecular biology techniques and genomics techniques, We have discovered huge parts of the pelagic ecosystems that were previously unknown to us. This does not mean that net plankton are not important, but they are just one part, and not even necessarily the largest part. Of the plankton community. So after size, a way to designate plankton is whether they spend their entire life as plankton, or just part of it. Holoplankton. Include many types of phytoplankton and pelagic crustaceans like copepods and ostracods. They are plankton for their entire life. Whereas meroplankton spend only a portion of their life as plankton. This includes the larvae of fishes, mollusks, crustaceans, a variety of different organisms that as adults will either live on the benthos or as nekton. Another way to classify plankton is whether they are primary producers or not. Phytoplankton. are the primary producers. They perform photosynthesis, and so they use light in order to generate organic molecules. Zooplankton, on the other hand, are heterotrophs, or consumers. Yet, the zooplankton can play a very important role in connecting the production of nano and picoplankton To higher levels of the food web, because it turns out that many of these plankton that are smaller than net plankton are also producers as well. There are photosynthetic bacteria and archaea, such as cyanobacteria, and even some of the smaller ciliates, and those cannot be consumed by fish, but they can be consumed by the zooplankton, and the zooplankton then take their energy and organic molecules to higher levels of the trophic web. We had discussed various types of plankton in previous chapters, but we'll revisit them here because they make up such important parts of the epipelagic communities. So diatoms. These are considered to be net plankton. They are extremely important primary producers. especially in polar waters. They are common in all marine waters, but tend to be more important in cold water. These diatoms may be solitary cells, or a colony of cells, and their outer shell is made out of silica. Our next group of phytoplankton are the dinoflagellates. There are over 1,200 species, and they each have a unique shape that's reinforced by plates of cellulose. They have two flagella. In grooves on the body that produce spinning motion. Some of these are bioluminescent. There are some that are toxic, such as Fisteria, and dinoflagellates are some of the species that cause red tides. 
Dinoflagellates are particularly prevalent in warm waters and can bloom when nutrients are plentiful. Our next type of phytoplankton are cyanobacteria. These are prokaryotes known as blue-green algae. They're able to carry out nitrogen fixation as well as photosynthesis. They are important primary producers. And we've come to find out they are far more abundant in the pelagic than originally thought. Many grow in filamentous colonies. where others may be solitary. Two more groups of phytoplankton are the coccolithophores. Which are members of the nanoplankton. And they can occur both in neuritic and oceanic waters. They have plates of calcium carbonate, which can be contributed to marine sediments and can eventually become chalk. The silicoflagellates have a star-shaped skeleton made out of silica and two flagella. of varying lengths. These two groups are so small that they are not often caught in plankton nets, yet they can make up important portions of the waters that they're found in. Now to discuss some of the zooplankton, especially zooplankton which are also holoplankton. Copepods are one of the most abundant marine crustaceans. which make them some of the most abundant organisms on Earth. They make up perhaps 70% of the zooplankton. They feed on phytoplankton. As well as other zooplankton. They serve, in turn, as a major source of food for other consumers. And as we can observe in this diagram, their appendages will be slightly different based on whether they are herbivorous or carnivorous. There are other crustacean zooplankton as well, such as krill, and other shrimps, and also ostracods. Ostracods are interesting crustaceans that almost appear to be bivalves because they have two outer shells, yet they have jointed appendages that stick out of them for feeding. You can also almost think of ostracods as free-swimming barnacles. Another group of zooplankton are the pelagic tunicates, the salps, and the larvaceans. They use mucus nets to capture food particles. Salps can be solitary or occur as large floating colonies. And the larvaceans, pictured below, will make a house out of mucus to capture food, yet they will often shed this house and make a new one shortly after. The discarded houses end up becoming an important component of what is known as marine snow. And that marine snow will carry some of the energy generated in the epipelagic down to lower levels of the water column. Another interesting type of holoplankton, zooplankton, are the pteropods, which are mollusks. In pteropods, the molluscan foot is modified 
as wings. Usually, they will have a reduced shell. And they can be found in the epipelagic, but also in deeper waters. The pteropods feed on phytoplankton and other zooplankton. Some more members of the holoplankton include the arrowworms, ketognaths. which are predators in their environment, often feeding on copepods, ostracods, and even other arrowworms. And then we have the jellies. They can range in size from microscopic all the way to hundreds of pounds. Comb jellies tend not to grow as large, but can still be much bigger than other members of the plankton community. They are considered plankton because they mostly drift in the currents. Holoplankton live their entire life as plankton, but meroplankton will be plankton only during their larval development. The meroplankton. Only spend a portion of their life as plankton. This includes larvae of animals that are part of the nekton as adults or part of the benthos, such as mollusks, polychaete worms, crustaceans, echinoderms, and many kinds of invertebrates. Villager larvae are common for mollusks, while the Ophiopleutius larvae would be for a brittle star, and the Bipinaria larvae would be for other echinoderms. These distinctive larval shapes often tie to different phyla or groups of animals. The epipelagic is not just home to plankton. There are nekton as well. The nekton include organisms that swim against the currents and purposefully move in any direction they choose. These include fishes, penguins, squids, sea turtles, and marine mammals. And that completes our discussion of the diversity of life in the epipelagic. Now, before our next video, I want you to think about what if you played a game of hide and seek, but there was nothing to hide behind? We'll talk about that in the next video.